Hey everyone, how's it going? Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. I hope you've enjoyed the last two videos about the birth of the Protestant Reformation. I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about the Renaissance Papacy, which sets the background for Erasmus, Martin Luther, uh, all of them. Um, most, of, uh, most people recognize the name Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI. The Renaissance Papacy, the period itself, goes back to the 14-teens, 20s, and 30s. Martin V is kind of the first pope uh, that gets the moniker Renaissance Papacy. But it's a fascinating time. If you're into politics, you would love the Renaissance Papacy because it's a time when the College of Cardinals, right, which is like, um, remember we talked about how uh, the universal church developed out of an admiration uh, for the Roman hierarchical structure, how they structured their government, right? Local, regional, metropolitan, bottom up, you know, uh, bureaucracy, leaders, each one has a, a larger area than the one before it, right? So the, the cardinal represents a region and uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, sent to the Vatican uh, to represent that area, wherever they happen to be from. But the whole period of the Renaissance, you have certain really powerful families uh, from France, Italy, and they are all just competing with each other for power and essentially trading the papacy and taking the seat at different times. Um, names, uh, you know, Rodrigo Borgia, there was one other Borgia Pope pretty early and I, I can't remember uh, his exact name or maybe it was after him. Um, anyway, so some of the other ones, Della Rovere, Piccolomini, Sforza, Colonna, um, Medici, right? All these names represent the competing interests in Italy. And we've heard this said a lot of, oh, this was a, quote, bad pope because they bought the papacy. Well, we saw uh, in a video I produced uh, about Pope Sylvester uh, using the, the actual primary source, the Liber Pontificalis, that the idea of buying the papacy, quote, unquote, uh, was present from the very beginning. When you were essentially pledging in the College of Cardinals to become Pope, it wasn't uncommon at all for you to kind of get rid of possessions that had been given to you. Oh, I have a castle in this city, and if I get your vote in the College of Cardinals, you know, that castle's going to be yours. I have this title, and if you give me your vote in the College of Cardinals, even though you hate my guts and our families are mortal enemies, I'll make you High Chancellor of the Church and uh, give you this uh, region, you know? So there was a lot of competing things in that way. And at that time, um, I think it's a little different. We project on the past, right? This is the church, therefore it should be holy, therefore it should be spiritual. How can all these things be going on and how can this be okay? Well, I think there's two things you need to think about. Uh, uh, we need to think about. One, the average everyday person at this time, knew nothing of the goings on inside the Vatican, right? The average farmer and peasant out there in the middle of nowhere had no relative connection to the papacy whatsoever. Um, so this was powerful people, uh, ascendancy in the age of early humanism, uh, competing using high politic, right? Uh, and, and so the idea that the church was corrupted by this process versus uh, the church just being a reflection of, of the period, you know, that's kind of the, the deal, right? Uh, you had several Renaissance uh, periods in Europe, you know? So any, uh, anyway, um, so Rodrigo Borges, Pope Alexander VI, immediately after him, we find something that Machiavelli says in The Prince to be very true, and we see it even in modern politics, right? Uh, the, the person who follows a legend is often like, you know, in office for a month or a really non-controversial person who just gives the, the party in power time to plan and form a direction and rally around a new person. Um, the one that immediately followed Pope Alexander VI was, uh, I forget his uh, papal name, uh, but it was uh, Piccolomini. He was a Piccolomini. Maybe it was... Um, Oh gosh, I can't remember, so I'm not even going to guess. Then after that, um, uh, Adela Rovere, uh, Julius II, who proved he, he was a mortal enemy of Alexander VI uh, as portrayed in the Netflix series and the Showtime series. Um, not sure we, uh, not sure that that's historically accurate, that they were particularly uh, any more enemies than the scheming that went on uh, among all of them. Um, but he proved to be really apt militarily. And also, as we talked about in another video with Christian Art, both Alexander VI, um, Della Rovere, uh, and, and even going back to Martin V, really all the great works of Christian Art that survive today 
um, you know, survive because these people commissioned them and gave work to these great artists whose names we know. Um, my particular favorite is Pope Paul III. Uh, he was a Farnese, which had a few representatives in the papacy, but he was a, a young cardinal under uh, Alexander VI. Then he, he, by the time he became pope, uh, he sat uh, as pope during the Council of Trent, right? Uh, when it started its many years of sessions. And by the time that happened, he literally had sat in most positions. He had been a cardinal. He had been uh, treasurer of the Vatican. I mean, this guy had held every position and he really was... You know, you probably couldn't have had a better person to uh, begin framing the Counter-Reformation, um, you know, to bring together the right canon lawyers and to develop the ideas. Uh, one of the misperceptions that we get today about that council is that, um, you know, in the Protestant Reformation, we had what? Uh, uh, the, the, the doctrine of justification, uh, we're saved through grace by faith alone. Uh, and the papacy as the Antichrist. Those were the two key tenets, right? So the Counter-Reformation, which began about 20 years after the nadir of the uh, Protestant Reformation in Europe at that time, uh, was the response to it, right? And I find fascinating, right? We've seen all the videos that, that have been produced on the Crusades. Um, and, you know, what rises, one of the things out of the Council of Trent is the Jesuits, and they have this conspiratorial reputation, but... If you think about it historically, it makes sense, right? You have uh, Pope Urban II um, established the idea at the beginning of the Crusades in the 1090s of military religious orders, right? And maybe they even went back further, but the idea of, uh, you know, a religious order and a, a military order kind of merged. If you think about it, the Jesuits are a perfect evolution of that, of what we saw, right? They're the, the guard dogs of the papacy. They are the... Um, uh, you know, there to make sure that people are Catholic by any means necessary. Uh, you know, they tended to be the really smart ones, the really virtuous ones, but the ones that were also capable of, of doing exactly what Machiavelli says in The Prince, and that is using power without the burden of morality in your decision making, understanding how power worked as a, um, you know, as a tool uh, of governance and using it that way. And, and they certainly were responsible for uh, raising the church back to a certain stature, but they also kind of ruined their reputation in the process. Eleven popes um, expelled the Jesuits at various times. The founding fathers exchanged letters talking about how wicked they were and how much they hoped they stayed out of, uh, stayed out of America. Uh, they were involved in things like the gunpowder plot, <clears throat> um, so, so, you know, their reputation is twofold. Now, they also established many of the world's greatest and most well-known educational facilities. Uh, so you might, there's two ways to think about that. One, are you getting a good education? Two, are you getting indoctrinated? So, um, anyway, so look forward to the next video. I'm working on it right now. It's about Martin Luther. Um, and... It's a goal of mine to tell a narrative different than that usual one. Because the usual one, the mainstream Protestant narrative about Martin Luther, I find it has many flaws. Because it projects on him that he had this goal of totally splitting off and doing all these things that ended up happening. And, and really what ended up happening was as nation states rose, they used that reformation of the church. Uh, the kings and, and queens and princes and rulers used Martin Luther and his name and his movement to kind of move the nation state system uh, out from under control of the church as well. So it's not that Martin Luther set out with the goal to uh, undermine the church as much as uh, the mainstream narrative maybe says. So we'll see that with some of the primary sources I've chosen to talk about. Anyway, hope you all are well, and I look forward to talking to you on the next one. Bye.